John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine. Ye are my, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth uh, much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you abide not in me, he is ca if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, <clears throat> and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, <clears throat> and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my, that, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Uh, I, I want to talk about the life that counts. The life that counts. Uh, I think about a lot of times, you know, people live a life, sin, sinners live a life of the world, they live a life of everything, and when they die, there's nothing that really counts in their life. Uh, the Bible talks about if you gain the whole world, lose your soul, what should it profit you? You could be the greatest of all the people of the world, own the world, and die without Christ, and your life would count as nothing. Uh, some people uh, die, and they've never accomplished nothing in their life and you look at them and you think man uh, what a wasted life <laughs> uh, they've wasted their life lived all these years died have nothing uh, and their life is not worth anything and uh, but he talks about here a life that counts a life that's uh, Christ is telling them how a life that really counts in fact James chapter 4 says what is your life what is your life and you look at your life and you take an examination of your life uh, you can kind of picture what is your life? What is your life worth? What is your life counted for? What have you accomplished in your life? A lot of questions we could ask about those. And Jesus is trying to tell us here what a life is that really counts. A life that's really going to amount to something. A life that at the end uh, is going to be worth something. And I don't know about you. I don't want to live all my life and die and not be not at count for something. Amen. Uh, in fact, one scripture over in Hebrews, he said, He being dead, yet liveth. What that means is he's dead, but yet his life, his testimony, his faith uh, lives on. All the heroes of faith, God put them in there, and their life, they're dead, but yet their life, the life counted so much that we still experience it today. We still talk about Abraham, Joshua, and all those fellows. Their life counted for something, and their life inspired us to keep on going for God. And, uh, and so I, I'll talk about that just for minutes and give you a little outline and we'll be through. But the life that counts. I thought, first of all, uh, a life that counts, and of course, you got to, uh, if your life's going to count, let me just say this and start, you've got to be born again. <laughs> right. any, any life outside of Christ ain't going to count for nothing. Right. Amen. It's just going to end up and, and waste it and die in their sins and go to hell and live there in hell eternally. No, no count of life. I don't care how much success you've gained. I don't care how much wealth you've gained and popularity or whatever. A life without Christ will never count, never amount to anything. So if you're going to have a life that counts, first of all, you've got to be saved, born again by the grace of God. That's why he said, abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. Uh, the Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. And so you've got to have Christ abiding in your heart. And you've got to abide in him, and he abides in you. He said, just like I'm abiding in the Father, and the Father's abiding in me. And he talks about the branches. What good is the branches without, uh, what, what good is uh, the branches without uh, the vine? 
And he said, you know, they, they got to be connected together. And he said, the, he said, abide in me, and I, as a branch cannot bring forth fruit, except it abide in the vine. There's the vine, there's the branches. You cut the branches off, guess what? It's going to die. <laughs> it's going to wither. And so but he said, without me, you can do nothing. And so the only life that counts is a life that, that a person that's been saved, born again by the grace of God. Amen? Amen? And so let's look at it right quick. Three or four things, and we'll hush. I thought about, first of all, the life that counts is a christ centered life look at verse number seven if you abide in me that word abide just means remain stable and fixed it means to continue to conform to it means to abide in by the rules accept without objection follow to keep to hold on to unless that vine uh that branch holds on and abides in that vine, my friend, it will not be anything. It's nothing. It's worth anything. But it abides. It holds on to. It's attached to. It remains fixed in that vine. And that vine is totally, or that branch is totally dependent upon that vine. That's the only time that branch can bring forth fruit. And a life that counts is a life that is a Christ-centered life. And I preached along that this morning, the will of God, I guess that morning again. But that, what that means is your whole life is centered around pleasing Christ. In fact, over in Corinthians, you know, he talks about that we might be well pleasing in his sight. In other words, that means we might, be, we might please him. Amen. And our life is to be a Christ-centered life. I read that, quoted that this morning. Paul said, if I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not I. But it's Christ that lived with me. And what Paul was saying is my whole life is wrapped up. My whole life is centered in living for Christ. Uh, and, and a Christ-centered life is the only way that a life that counts. If you abide in me, you abide in me, you can abide in anything else, and it's worthless. <laughs> Amen? Hey, come on, I'm just teaching you something this morning. We'll just do a teaching lesson, okay? Uh, I thought about this. You ever think about the prodigal son? You can, you can preach it all kinds of ways. But you ever think about the prodigal son? There came a time, there came a time that he felt like he didn't need the father. <laughs> he was in the father's house. You can preach him lost, saved, whatever you want to. But he was in the father's house. He was the father's son. But there came a time he didn't feel like he needed uh, the father in his life. And he left. And from the time he left to the time he got back, everything he'd done didn't count for nothing. <laughs> right. Amen? Wasted. The Bible said he wasted his substance. He wasted his life, uh, and he was outside. Uh, and he, he left Christ, or left the Father, and he was outside of the Father, and he didn't feel like he needed the Father. But there came a day he came to himself and realized the only way that he could have life that would count would be go back to the Father's house. Amen? Amen. And sometimes we have seen people leave the house of God, think they didn't need, they didn't need God. And they get out, and guess what? <clears throat> For a number of years, they waste their life. And they finally come back and realize they must come back to God and let God work in their heart and work in their life. What they saw the prodigal son, when he came to himself, he says, I do need the Father. <laughs> And he wasted everything. Hey, he had, a, he had a, 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 the potential to do something with the inheritance he got, but he wasted every bit of it. Amen. And left the Father. But when he came back to the Father, I don't know what he built back, but I'm sure he built some things back in his heart and life. But let's go a little farther. The, the elder brother never left the house. He never left the farm. He never left the father's house. But you know what? He just as backslid as the prodigal son was. Amen. Amen. You know what? He, he was in the father's house, but he had no love for the brother. <laughs> he never find where he said, Father, if you let me go, I'll go find him. Uh, he never. In fact, he was bitter when the, when the boy come home. He didn't even have a relationship with the father. <laughs> in, in, in the father's house, but he still didn't have no relationship with the father. And his life is just as messed up. You know what? There's a lot of people never misses a Sunday, but their life don't count because they don't have no relationship with God and they have no love for the brother. Right. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If you abide in me, you live in him. You live in Christ. That branch is, to, that branch is totally dependent upon that vine. And see, the strength and the nurture, that vine is down in the ground and the strength and the virtue comes up through that vine and into the branches. Amen? Well, that's what we are. We're in Christ 
Christ is in the Father. And Christ draws everything from God the Father. And my friend, he flows through Christ into us. And my friend, the only benefit we have and the only strength we have and the only way we can have a life that counts is to be a Christ-centered life. Amen. It's kind of like a marriage. <laughs> I don't know why I get on marriages twice today. But anyway, it's kind of like a marriage. Did you know a lot of our, just stay with me, a lot of marriages are centered around things. You know, you know, people tell everybody, tell their girls, you know, marry rich. <laughs> Amen. Well, what good is it to marry rich if you don't love them? Somebody said, I'm going to marry a wealthy man. My granddaughter says that all the time. She said, I'm going to marry a wealthy man and keep me up. I'm going to have maids and servants. I said, good luck. Amen. If that's what you're marrying for, it ain't going to last. Amen. Some people marry for wealth. Some people marry for looks. <laughs> Oh, Lord, don't marry for looks. Amen. You ever see people, oh, she's so pretty, she's so slim. 20 years, it'd be over. <laughs> <laughs> they people ain't going to like it, but you help me out, okay? Uh, that, that we change. We all change. We change. Amen. Uh, don't marry because you got a full set of hair. Look here, you lose it. <laughs> Amen. Oh, her hair's so beautiful. Well, they're going to lose it. It changes. And if that's what you marry for, my friend, then you're, you're not going to last. You don't marry for things. You don't marry because they got homes. You don't marry because they got cars. You don't marry because they got successful jobs and all that stuff. My friend, you marry because you love one another. And my friend, the, 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 she is the queen and he is the king. And your life is built around a relationship with each other. And you're just as happy as a tent as you are a mansion. Because it's not what things is each other. Amen. Uh, amen. You tell these young folks now, you, know, you can go, you can tell these young folks, you know, you can just sit and drink a cup of coffee. <laughs> you can just sit and table and drink a cup of coffee and stay an hour or two, and they look at you like, really? <laughs> you know, they think they got to be out doing this, got to do that, got to do this, got to plan everything every weekend. Sometimes it's just fun, just have fun, just you and them. Right. Huh? And, and you love them, and you make, you're, you're, in other words, what I'm saying, if you're going to make it in your marriage, she has got to be the center of your life. And he has got to be the center of your life and you make much of each other. That's going to be a relationship that's going to last. That's going to be a marriage that counts. Amen. And a life that counts is a Christ-centered life. When your life is centered around everything, all, as I preached this morning, all your moves and all your decisions and all your things and all your wants is all centered around Christ and what he wants and how he is and the will of God in your heart and life. So a life that counts, number one, is a Christ-centered life. Verse 7. And then look at verse 7. Not only that, if you abide in me, that's a Christ-centered life. And then number two, and my words abide in you. A life that counts is not only a Christ-centered life, but it's a Bible-anchored life. And my words, my words abide in you. Amen? Amen. Christ-centered life is one that this Bible, the words of God, <coughs> abides in your heart and in your life. I preached this here before uh, a long, long time ago. But there's five things God tells us to do about the Word of God. Number one, He tells us to hear it. We're to come to church and we're to hear and listen and hear the Word of God. And then we're to read the Word of God and we're to study the Word of God. We're to memorize the Word of God. We're to meditate upon the Word of God. As we do those five things, you know what happens? As you hear the Word of God, and as you study the Word of God, and my friend, as you read the Word of God, and as, my friend, you uh, uh, memorize it and put all this stuff together, and you meditate on it, it's like a cow, and I've told you this before, it's like a cow eating grass, eats grass, eats grass, eats grass all morning, and then about lunchtime it goes down and sits down on the shade tree, it belches that up, they call it chewing the cud, and it belches it up, and it digests that, and that, that uh, grass becomes a part of them, and therefore for milk flows from them. They produce something. God said you're to meditate. In other words, take the word of God that you've heard, you've studied, you've read, meditate on it, chew on it, digest it until it becomes a part of you. Amen? Until his word becomes a part of you. Bible anchor. You know, that, Bible, that word anchor just means, you know, you ever go fishing and you anchor it down. That means that thing's a holding that boat in place so you can sit there and fish. Well, a Bible anchor life is, a, is it means that the Word of God 
anchored you down. That's what you stand on. That's what holds you together. That's what keeps you from falling. That's what keeps you from drifting away is to have a Bible anchored life, a life that your, your world and your soul and your mind and your heart is filled with the Word of God. Uh-huh. I know we preach that all the time. Still, people don't read their Bible. Amen. But you know what? There ought to be a daily diet of the Word of God. You know, you ever, you ever heard people say, well, you've got to eat right. I'm talking about natural food. You know, you've got to eat right to keep strength up. Amen. You've got to eat right. You've got you to eat certain things. You know, you've got to, uh, when, when, when we used to, well, as kids, we used to work on the farm, and uh, we'd haul hay and do uh, work corn and, and all that stuff, and, and, uh, and they'd get up, you know, and they didn't fix us no Pop-Tarts. <laughs> we didn't have a bowl of cereal. Uh, remember Miss Brown, she'd say, I'll tell you what, she'd make them big cat head biscuits and gravy and eggs and kick all that stuff, you know, that everybody says it's killing you now. Huh? <laughs> you know why it's killing you now? Because you don't sweat, you don't work. <laughs> but we worked. And they'd fix the meal. They'd say, you can't make it on post doses. You can't make it on a bowl of cereal. you got to have some strength. Long time to lunch. And we'd come in from lunch and have big lunch ready. <laughs> We'd eat lunch, take about an hour and out, and hit the field again. Work till dark. You know what they'd say? You got to have something to strengthen. You got to have something. If you don't, you'll fall apart. You'll faint before lunch. You know what? We're eating on everything except the Word of God. That's why we're so weak. That's why we're so falling apart spiritually. That's why we need a revival every time we turn around. That's why we have to run to the altar every time, every service we got. It's because we're falling apart because we don't have no strength. Our strength comes from the Word of God. And a life that counts is a life that anchors their life upon the Word of God. Amen. So it's a Bible anchored life. It's a Christ centered life. It's a Bible anchored life. You're writing this down, number three. It's a prayer supported life. Verse number seven if, my, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, what you shall ask, what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's a Bible uh, uh, supported life. You know what? Uh, God, the Bible, and you know this, uh, I'm not preaching anything you don't know, and Brother Doug ain't preached to us. Uh, the, the Bible is God speaking to you. And prayer is you speaking to God. <laughs> and, and, and you've got to have a prayer. You can, read, you can know all about it, but you won't know. If you don't have a prayer life, you're in trouble. Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. You can have, uh, 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 in fact, I, I dealt with a couple back, I guess in the middle of last year, I dealt with this couple. Got a nice home, nice home. Got cars, got money. They got everything good jobs nice furniture uh, I mean good and he you know it, it, but they're having problems and they want me to come talk to them and so I come talk to them you know and sometimes sometimes the best thing you can do in the marriage situation is, is let them talk and you just shut up and listen and I'm just sitting there listening I'm listening to him I'm listening to her and I'm listening to him I'm listening to her and, and I'm talking and finally finally I look at him and I said I found your problem I found your problem and they said what is it I said, there's a failure in communication. I said, y'all talked about having this. You talked about having that. You talk about doing this. You talk about doing that. You talk about what, your, uh, what you do and what you do. And what. And I said, you don't talk about nothing, about doing something, anything together. And I said, you never talk about just talking to each other. I said, what y'all need to do is go out somewhere and buy you a tent. Go out in the woods somewhere. Don't take your television. Don't take your phone. Don't take your computer. Don't take nothing but you and a can of pork and beans and sit and talk to each other and communicate with each other. Amen. And fellowship with each other. Amen. And sometimes we got everything going. And my friend, we got this going, that going, TV going, everything in the world going. But we fail to take time to talk to God. There's got to be a prayer supported life. You've got to support that word that you hear, that word that you read, that word that you study. You've got to support it with prayer. And have a prayer life in your life. That's a life that counts. It's a life that knows how to pray. Huh? I'm talking about more than just this little rituals we have. <laughs> Bless my forward no more. Say the same thing every time we ask a blessing. We say the same thing. Amen. <laughs> we say it in a hurry. Oh, hungry. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Come on now, help me out. Uh -huh. 
And uh, we, we had a prayer. I'll just give you this. We had a prayer night. We had a prayer service at our church one time. I called a prayer meeting. I said, for, for, we started at 7 o'clock that morning. We was going to go to 7 o'clock the next morning. And I said, I'll be at the church the whole time. And I said, the church will be open. If you ladies want to come, you can come and pray. It'll be safe. There'll be somebody here. Uh, and it'll be safe. And you can come through the day, through the night, whatever. Anybody, men, women can come. And you can pray. And come spend the time in prayer. And go home. And, and people would come. <laughs> people would come. Grown men would come. Deacons would come. And, and one deacon came. And he walked down the aisle, altar. And I was sitting back there in the office in the sound room. And he came down. And he knelt. Within three minutes, he is up and walked back out the door. I thought, man, he didn't even stay long enough to get God's attention. He met, it, he met himself uh, uh, coming up or going down. Nothing. I mean, just, and I thought, why'd you waste your time? Right. I drive all the way over here for three minutes. Amen? Either that or he's more spiritual than I was. <laughs> I'm so old, it takes me three minutes just to get down there. But what are you saying, Preacher? I'm saying it takes a prayer to support life. You've got to support your life with prayer. That, that prayer is what strengthens you. That communication with God, that's what strengthens you. Amen. Me and my wife, we talk. We talk all the time. We, we talk. Now, y'all don't think Kay talks a lot, but you get her just by herself, she talks. And, uh, and, and she, we'll talk. Sometimes we ride for hours and just talk. Never turn the radio on, you know. We, we, you know, we don't. We, we cut the television off. Sometimes we just sit there on the couch and talk. Sometimes of the morning we get up, we, talk, we make some coffee, we just sit there and we talk, talk about our day, talk about different things and things. And we just sit and talk. You know what? I found through talking, Slick, through talking, our, our, our love has grown closer and closer and stronger and stronger. And our relationship has grown stronger. And you know the old saying? The old saying is, as long as you live together, you get to looking like each other, sound like each other, thinking like each other. Well, that's true, because sometimes I'll be thinking, and I'll say, I, I'll say well, I think we're to go down there, uh, just Captain D's or something. And she said, well, that's what I was thinking about this morning. I think, man, this is dangerous. Because <laughs> I hope everybody, I hope we start looking like her. But, but you know, it, it, what it is, you, you live together so long, you communicate together. They say you start taking the, thinking alike and talking alike and thinking the same things. And you know, that's what happened to us. We soon be married 50 years in September. And you know what? Uh, I, I look back at our life. We have grown so much. Sometimes the things that I do, the same th the things that I like and things that she like, we're, we're back together. Some things you still didn't like, and now we like them because we have been together. We fellowship together. We talk together. We shared things together. And we have become more of one uh, in the, lo the long run than, than, I ever, than I ever thought about when I was a young person being like that. You know what? The more you, the more you center your life around Christ, and the more you read this Bible, and the more you pray, the more you'll become Christ-like. Amen. Amen. The more Christ will be in you, the more people look and see Christ in you. So, so uh, it's a Christ-centered life. It's a Bible-anchored life. It's a prayer-supported life, and then it's a fruit-bearing life. He said, "If you abide in me, that's your Christ-centered life, and my words abide in you, that's a Bible-anchored life. You shall ask what you will; it shall be done to you. That's a prayer-supported life." But then look at verse eight: "Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit; so shall you be my disciple." Now I know the first thing you go, you know first thing people think about when they read this chapter is they bring forth fruit, much fruit, more fruit. It talks about fruit, then more fruit, and then much fruit. The first thing we talk about, you know what we think? You know what's the first thing you think about bringing fruit? Winning souls. <laughs> this first scripture has nothing to do with winning souls. <laughs> it's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. It's talking about the more that you center your life around Christ, the more you have a Bible anchor life, the more you have a prayer life supporting your Bible life, the more fruits you'll bear. In fact, if you go over to the book of Galatians, he talks about the fruits of the flesh. And he talks about, my friend, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, uh, emulations, wrath, strife, uh, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. He said all these is the, the, the works and the, uh, the fruits of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, uh, temperance, faith, which there's no law. In other words, the more, the more that you center your life around Christ and the more that you uh, read your Bible. And the more that you pray, the more of the fruits of the Spirit will dwell in your life. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, and temperance. <laughs> you say, well, I need to get rid of my, I need to, I, I, I got a temper. I'll tell you how to get rid of it. Center your life around Christ. Build your life around the Word of God. Have a prayer life. And you know what? 
that 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 hate will be turned to love. <laughs> that defeat and that no victory will be turned to joy. And you can have joy in your life and you have victory in your life if you abide in Christ. You know, if you build if you if you build your marriage around each other instead of things, <laughs> you'll find more happiness and more joy and more love than you've ever had. Amen. Amen. Come on now, help me out. It's 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 not it's not all the things that we have. And, and you know some people have they you ever see these people they'll build a house, <laughs> they'll build their house and and build it and and it's just exactly like they want. They, this this is the plans we want. They build the house after they get it all built. Like six months later, well I, we need to change the color. Or, you know, I wish I'd have knocked that wall out, or I wish I'd done this. You know, never happy. But you know what? In Christ, you can find happiness and joy with each other. Amen. I mean, I, I don't, don't mind. It don't matter if I'm in a camper. It don't matter if I'm in a house. It don't matter if I'm in a in just a normal house like we got. Or if I had a mansion, that ain't got a thing to do with it. It's her. Amen. As long as she's there, I'm fine. Amen. Amen. As long as I'm there, she's there. We stay in some motels sometimes. I think, I, honestly, God, I think some preachers are blind. Uh, they put you in places you think <laughs> you must be blind. You you cannot see this place. Ain't worth staying in. You know. I think what they do, they just get on the phone and find the cheapest place they can find, and that's where they put you. Tight was, you know. Amen. It's one thing about this church, you always do first class. That's that's one thing, the reason God has blessed this church and blessed Brother Doug, uh, always first class. I was always first class when I was pastor in church. Amen. But you know what, they, they put you somewhere, you know, and, and you know what, you, you're really, really comfortable. I mean, when you stay in a place, like we went in Florida uh, some time ago, we stayed in a place, and they got men walking around with Doberman pictures all night long, you know you're in the wrong place. <laughs> I mean, when you see them walking around them dogs all night long, you say, I am in the wrong place. <laughs> Get the guns out, amen. And I'll sleep half time, and you stay, and you sleep, and I'll guard the next hour. You sleep, you know, it's one of them places. <laughs> uh, amen. And you got more roaches in there, and you got people, you know, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And, and, and don't laugh, we've stayed a few places like that. Amen. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, if you do that, you know, he's not talking about winning souls. He's not. He's talking about bringing forth that fruits of the spirit: love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. Uh, the more you have that Bible center life, the more love you'll have. The more you center your life around each other, the more you'll love you'll have for each other. The more, the, the more joy you'll have for each other. The more, uh, boy, we need this, don't it? The more long suffering we'll have putting up with each other. Amen. And the fruits of the Spirit will be manifested in life. But I'm just going to be honest with you. If you don't have a Christ-centered life and you don't have a Bible-supported life and uh, or anchored life and a prayer-supported life, you ain't going to manifest much of the spirits, the fruits of the Spirit. It's not going to be there. Amen? It's not going to be in the heart. That's what God said. If you abide in me. And if my words abide in you. And if prayer is part of your life, then the next verse says you can bring forth much fruit. That fruits of the Spirit. That fruits, my friend, of things. And then let me give you this. Uh, it's not only a, a, a Christ-centered life. It's not only a Bible-anchored life. It's not only a prayer-supported life and a fruit-bearing life. But you, you ever seen somebody really get saved and their whole life changed? I mean, they was hateful. <laughs> and then they they become a loving person. Amen? They was, they was just uh, wicked. And they find themselves clean. They was full of world and sin and full of habit. And they lay them habits aside. And their whole life changes. You know what? They got saved. And they start building their life around the Word of God. They start praying. And you know what? Your life will change. Amen. If anybody be in Christ, He is a new creature. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad of what I ain't what I used to be. <clears throat> and uh, I'm 71 years old. I still have to fight it. Sometimes people make me so mad I just won't fight. That's the flesh in me. Amen. We was, we was in a meeting a while back and running some people. And I told Kay, <laughs> Kay had me by the arm, you know. She, she knows me. She had me by the arm. Said, just be quiet. Just be quiet. And I told Kay, I said, if you hadn't said anything, I was going to punch them right in the nose. I was just, you know what that was? That was that old flash. Right? right. You said, what'd you have to do? <laughs> Before I could preach, I had to go study and pray. <laughs> Get my heart back right, you know, from that just temper that, that let go. You know, you say, how do you overcome that? You study, and you pray, and you let Christ be the center of your life. Yes. Amen? Amen. 
Bible said he reviled, but he was reviled, but he reviled not again. When Christ was reviled, he didn't come back with reviled. He came back with love. Amen. And so then look, look at the last thing. Look, it's not only that, but it's a love motivated life. Verse nine through uh, down through there, he says, "As the Father have loved me." So I have loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's a, it's a love motivated life. Verse 9, he says we're to continue in his love. Continue. You know what? You know what caused me to get saved? I seen, Brother Slick, I seen the love of God manifested toward me. I mean, I wasn't worth loving, but he loved me. Amen. I deserve to go to hell, but he loved me. And I look at that, and I think, who would love me? Who would care? And God says that uh, he goes on there. He said, greater love would have no man than this, that he laid down his life for you. He, he loved me enough that I wasn't worth it, but still, he laid down his life and took my place. And he said, continue in that love. I want that same kind of love that God had. Amen. And you continue in that love. Christian love, it's a, it's, a, it's a continual. And he said, if you keep my commandments, the love of God, the love of God will cause you to want to keep the commandments of God. And his commandments are not grievous, the Bible says. You know, I, and I've given this illustration before, a little boy and girl getting married one time. And they met with the preacher, and the preacher was talking to him. And, you know, he went through that little uh, ritual that they have, you know. Uh, I, I can't even think about it now. What's them vows? You know, love and honor and cherish and obey. You know, the same, same little vows. Everybody gets married, the same old vow. They need to change them because nobody keeps them. But uh, y'all get that in a minute, amen. <laughs> but, you know, they go through that little thing. And he went through that thing and showed, the, you know, the vows that he's going to use to marry them. And that little boy said, that won't work. And the preacher said, what do you mean it won't work? He said, I've married several couples with their same vows. What do you mean? He said, don't say nothing to her about her darning my socks and fixing my supper and washing my clothes and, and all that stuff, sweeping the floors. And the, the little girl got him by the hand, and she said, that don't have to be on that paper. I'll do that. It's spelled love, L-O-V-E, love in my heart, will cause me to do those things. I'm going to tell you what, the love of God comes in your heart. There's some things just causes you to do right. Amen. It causes you to go the other way. Amen. You don't have to do it because uh, uh, of rituals. You don't have to do it because you're forced to sign a piece of paper. You do it because you love God. Amen. Amen. And, and then he said it's a, uh, it's a constant love. You shall abide in my love. Verse number 10. It's a constant. The same love of God is in our heart. See, Christ... He come in our heart. He is love. God is love. Amen. And when he came in your heart, when you got saved, that love's never changed. Never changed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Never has changed. That same love that God's come in, the initial love, is Amen. still there. Amen. You know, some people get married, they say they love each other, but it changes. <laughs> Something happens, you know, that changes. Somebody kept, you know, somebody coming along, they think looks better. You know, <laughs> told a couple one time. I told a little girl she's 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 flirting around with another guy and ended up divorcing and married him. And she said, "What do you think, preacher?" I said, "Well, I said don't worry about it. His socks stink just like that other guy's did. <laughs> He's gonna have bad habits just like the other guy did. So you might as well start looking for another. One. If you're looking for a perfect one, you're in trouble. <laughs> Amen? Amen. But you know, you keep that same love. It's kind of like." Uh, ladies say amen right here it's kind of like when you was a dating it didn't matter if they showed up at your house just sitting there I was supposed to, no I got this song it, it, uh, if you show up to their house you know they wasn't ready well, you just that's fine <laughs> now you've been married 10 years you're sitting out the car bong bong <laughs> either come on or drive your own car <laughs> you remember them days remember the days they opened the door for you <laughs> now they holler get it <laughs> and if you ain't careful you get in and you ain't got your other leg in there then a moving down the road and changes <laughs> amen <laughs> come on ladies say amen right there amen. Their, their, their attitude the way it's changed I wonder what happened if some people just kept that up they probably wouldn't have been in divorce court if they kept it up yep. uh, that same little loving you know girl that you are always wanted to be just perfect for him <laughs> come on now <laughs> Don't let him in. I ain't never heard of him. 
Now you got the same old house coat you wore for 14 years, got 13 holes in it. It comes in, your hair looks like the explosive of a master's factory. You go to work, you fix up. You stay home, you don't ever fix up. Come on now. <laughs> Used to, you wouldn't let them see you like it. Now you are. <laughs> we relax. Things change. Amen. I don't mean running around and looking pretty all the time. <laughs> But I'm saying just things change. Things happen. You know what? And it, uh, I wonder what happened if we kept those things up. Hey, yeah. hey. He said that love of God come, come continually abides in you. Amen. I seen a program on, on television a while back. And it's talking about how many times they said what the average time was that people would tell each other that they loved each other in, the, in a matter of a week. And I was amazed. In a whole week, the number one answer was three. I thought, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ahead of them. <laughs> and we tell each other we love her every day. Ever. There's not a day goes by. Most times, four, five, six times a day, we tell each other. Or we'll send a text to each other. Or we manifest our love to each other, you know, on a continual basis. Aren't you glad God just don't love occasionally, but he continually Amen. loves us. Amen. I'll tell you what, that Christ in our life is a continual love for Christ. Love for Christ. And when you love Christ, you love the church. Amen. So, so, a, Christ, a life that counts. A life that counts. It's a Christ-centered life if you abide in me. It's a Bible-anchored life in my words about in you. It's a prayer-supported life. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. It's a fruit-bearing life. Uh, Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. It's a love-motivated life. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. Uh, the love of Christ constrains me. In other words, what that Paul said, it's the love of Christ that nudges me on, pulls me on, keeps me going. Amen. Kay has a, Kay has a lot of health issues and had several surgeries. You know that. And she's had a lot of surgeries and different things. And she has arthritis, has a lot of problems, more problems than, than, than she manifests or talks about. And a lot of things she can't do, and a lot of things that she can't accomplish, like mopping, different things, and certain vehicles she can't get in, do things. She can't carry stuff and all that stuff. And so I do all that stuff. I'm not putting my own horn. I just do that. We pull in the motel. You know what I tell her? I said, just go in the room. I give her a kiss. Just go in the room, sit down, and play on your iPad or whatever. I'll unload the truck. And I unload the truck, put everything up where it's supposed to be, and get her coffee pot out, set it up. We don't never go nowhere without a coffee. I set that up, get everything, put her stuff in the closet and everything. And she told me one day, she sat there by Josh, and she said, she said, I, she said, I know you get tired. I know you get tired of doing all this stuff that I can't do. I said, never. I said, I love you enough that that don't faze me a bit. I said, I don't do it because I have to. I said, I do it because I love you. And I know there's the same thing. And there's some things I can't do. And she does it. I don't wash clothes. <laughs> okay, said, so what are you going to do if I die? I said, I'm going to the laundry. Going to the cleaners. They can do it. <laughs> Amen. Would call my daughter in laws, but they can't do it either. <laughs> but, oh, oh, I forgot we're on tape. Amen. <laughs> Brought that out right there, will you? <laughs> uh, but you know, there's things I, that she can do that I can't do. You know, and, and, and there's things that I can do and help her, and she helps me. And we work all these years. We, we've been together soon, be 50 years, and I've never, never left for a revival meeting. I mean, they, I've had preachers call me on Sunday night. Say, Brother Mike, can you start a meeting? We had a great day. We're going to kick a meeting off. Can you be here tomorrow night? I said, yes, sir, I can be there. And I go to my closet, and my clothes are ready. Never. Amen. Never been where they wasn't ready. You know what? That love that we have for each other causes us to do things for each other and with joy and with happiness. Amen? Amen. Well, when you have a christ in life, coming to church ain't no dread. <laughs> it's a happy time. Reading your Bible, serving God, living for God, giving your tithes. You don't have to regret giving your time. Regret giving your time. It's a joy to give those things. It's a joy to talk to Him. It's a joy to witness. It's a joy to sing. It's a joy to preach. It's a joy to live. I don't know about you. I want my life to be a Christ-centered life. My whole life to be centered around what Christ wants in my life. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.